OK, let's get started. And this is the 93rd Security Thought Leadership webinar. And we've been here twice a week, every week since the crisis started, where we've been examining an issue of central importance to the security world. And the idea of thought leadership is to critique what's going on today in order that we may get a better type of security tomorrow. So our object in these sessions is not to try and solve all the problems of the world, but try and identify what the issues are and how we can begin to think differently and can think constructively about them. As is the way, uh, we've got three panelists today, one from Oman, one from the United Kingdom and one from Hong Kong, all experts in different aspects of security. In a second, I'll be inviting them to introduce themselves. And once they've done that, I'll be inviting them to make their opening statement. And the topic is challenges in aviation security. How will it emerge from a sequence of crises? So this is not just about COVID-19. This is about uh, um, uh, 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 Brexit, about uh, um, air, 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 airport problems, about airline issues. This is about concerns about terrorism. Uh, a whole range of threats. And we'll be asking our panel to comment on these. Now, don't forget, after they've all spoken, I, I will be inviting you to ask questions. So if you'd like to ask a question, use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen and get in early, get your questions in early. And I promise I'll endeavor to include you in the discussion. So without further ado then, let's uh, go to our panel and uh, let's ask them to introduce themselves first. Let's go to Jeffrey Moore. Jeffrey, can you introduce yourself first? Uh, yes, good day to everybody, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jeff Moore. I am currently a security consultant with uh, Old Arabian Partners. I'm based in Hong Kong, um, but uh, I've spent the majority of my career working all over the world in the Middle East, uh, Europe, and the uh, Far East, building um, large integrated physical and electronic security solutions for, for all types of industries, including the aviation sector. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, um, from there, we'll go to a man and ask Ali to introduce himself. Ali. You're on mute, Ali. Sorry. Um, I'm, a I'm, I'm a retired colonel. Um, I was the vice president um, of um, Oman Group uh, Security, Oman Air Group Security, and I was a consultant. Um, I've worked for a refinery as head of security, and I'm now the head of um, um, uh, security and uh, uh, well, security and and uh, crisis management center of excellence. So I basically give advice to the government-owned companies for security and uh, crisis management, and I still consult for security for Oman Air and the other um, government um, um, airports. Thank you very much indeed, Ali. And finally, to the United Kingdom and to Andy. Andy, uh, please can we uh, uh, introduce yourself? Good afternoon, everybody. And Martin, thank you for inviting me on the webinar. Um, I've been the Managing Director of ICTS UK now um, for some 20 months. And prior to that, I held airport customer service positions for 40 years with three major US airlines, Northwest Airlines at London, Gatwick, 18 years US Airways for 16 years, and was Director of Operations for Europe for US Airways, overseeing 20, 23 airports, and finally four years with American Airlines in the same position, uh, overseeing 55 flights a day to the United States. Uh, but I changed and swapped over to ICTS. ICTS kept my flights to the United States safe and secure, um, and as I worked very closely with them on all security issues during the last 33 years, it was a privilege therefore to join the ICTS family and as you said earlier, gamekeeper turned poacher. Exactly. And thank you very much indeed for joining us. Great panel. Uh, once again, uh, a group of experts from around the world. I know many of you write to me and tell me how impressed you are with the panel we, we, we managed to produce. OK, without further ado, I'll tell you what we'll do then. We'll uh, um, ask each of our panellists for our opening statement. And let's go back to Jeff. Jeff first, your opening statement, please. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Martin. Um, we are in uh, very interesting and difficult times, um, but the aviation sector has been in fairly difficult times for the past few years. We've seen massive pressure on uh, non-flight and uh, non-aviation revenues in airports. Uh, we're seeing uh, increasing pressure from airlines on many airports. Many, uh, ver a very large proportion of the airports in Europe have, have been non-profit making for a long time. 
And this puts it makes it extremely difficult for them to um, uh, to change the culture in aviation, which is, as we all know, has been for a long time, a, a highly safety led culture with um, security often taking uh, the, the back seat in, 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 in many regards. Uh, we have uh, a range of standards that are um, just uh, variably applicable across the world in different forms, in different parts of the aviation sector. And it makes for a very difficult situation where we have uh, different countries taking different approaches to, to how, how they secure their borders. And we're now in a situation where in the future, lapses of security um, on international flights could result in new outbreaks and a uh, very rapid spread of new viruses and the like. And so we need to start to take the way we look at security in, in aviation uh, even more seriously before. And obviously with the added pressure of the, uh, the new uh, environmental carbon uh, taxes over the next few years or carbon uh, over the next few years, uh, this is gonna be more and more of an issue. In my view, the issues uh, of the aviation sector over the next few years still break down into three uh, very specific areas, and they're much the same as the areas that have been for a long time. Uh, particularly now we have the issue of trust and who trusts who and who owns the facts and who owns the truth about uh, the perceptions around different me methods of applying security in, into different parts of the aviation sector and how we as an industry uh, react to that when, when we're being judged on perceptions that are not necessarily based on truth. We, along with all of the rest of the security industry, are still struggling with the issue of convergence. And that's not just the convergence between cyber and physical, but it is the, the, the understanding that risk management is an enterprise-wide function. It needs to be taken seriously at the C-suite level and then at all stakeholders down the chain. That's something that still isn't being addressed really very well anywhere in the industry. And the third aspect is the, the adoption of avoidable vulnerabilities, which we are still doing. And in a time like now, where we have um, knee-jerk reactions and responses to uh, try to put in uh, countermeasures or mitigations around the, the COVID situation, we're getting people adopting pieces of technology that are not tried and tested and are obviously full of vulnerabilities. And those are the things that are gonna continue to come back and bite us in the future when, um, everybody's supply chains, not just the 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 the, the, uh, the ones that we look at, but also the ones that work in the terrorist and criminal world when their supply chains come back on, on, on online and their modes of travel come back become available again, they're going to be able to exploit many of these vulnerabilities. And we already know that they're there, but vendors don't want to talk about them. Regulators don't want to talk about them. And as a result, uh, end users believe that there aren't any vulnerabilities and they keep on blithely doing the same old thing over and over again. And that's not helping anybody. Jeff, thank you very much indeed. Some really salient points there. Don't forget audience, if you'd like to get a question on the question and answer button, Q and A button at the bottom of your screen. If you get your questions in early, we'll endeavor to include them in our, our discussion. Right, uh, um, let's go to Ali. Ali, your opening statement, please. Three minutes from you on what you consider the issues to be. I think, first of all, um, we are actually uh, changed a lot, okay, in the last year and a half since COVID started. And uh, it's going to be very, very difficult to go back to business as usual. As uh, my good friend, um, uh, Mr. Moore said, is that, um, um, first of all, the regulators and the conditions they're putting on the airlines, on the airports, and the problems that we are facing, don't forget that we've also lost a lot of good people, a lot of good jobs have had to go from pilots to crew to, to security because the airports and airlines were not, were not um, um, functioning. So there's a lot of change happening. And the problem is now, when we go back business to usual, it will have to be studied on how we can stop, we can stop um, um, people coming in and going out with affecting the aviation industry. I mean, um, one of the biggest problems that I see now is that um, the challenges we've got is we're opening up to become very, very um, open and um, not taking security as it should be. For example, we've stopped cutting down, we've stopped um, you know, physical handling of security, and we're more looking at using uh, machinery, and we are looking at safety, which is very important, don't get me wrong, but I think um, um, security-wise, um, we have let down our guard too much and to go back to start um, getting our crew to start searching the aircraft, our, our, our um, ground handling staff to start questioning and the, the uh, document checkers to start asking about security questions and everything 
everybody is trying to keep away from it. And that is a big thing, I feel. And, and um, it's opening doors for cybersecurity, it's opening doors for people um, who want to abuse the system, who want to go in, and to open doors to, to, to um, criminology and to theft and to, to smuggling, because everybody is afraid of touching and feeling and going through. That's my biggest concern in aviation security. Um, now, um, everybody is, is um, counting you know, um, um, everything of, of um, how many hours, how many time they spend or you know, on the counters with the customers who are really afraid of um, catching up with people. That's my biggest concern. And it will take us a lot of time to go back to, to what we used to do in aviation security. Ali, thank you very much indeed. Really, really interesting. Uh, um, uh, a lot to worry about there. Uh, don't forget, question answer button at the bottom of your screen. If you want to get a question, we'll endeavour to come to you after we've heard our third opening statement. And that's from Andy. Andy, over to you. OK, let, I mean, let's remember it throughout all of this. The safety and security of the passengers, crews and airport staff are paramount above all, whether it's conventional terrorism or, or biosecurity that we're looking at. Um, the pand pandemic has taken aviation to a new and unprecedented low. <clears throat> Airline fleets obviously have been placed in storage. Who would have thought of that? And in some cases, we've witnessed the demise of aircraft types, such as the Boeing 747. Airports have lost much of their revenue gleaned from aircraft landing parking fees and, of course, the travelling public. This has placed the airports and airlines in loggerheads with each other, naturally. Consumer confidence uh, needs to get back to pre-COVID levels, which it will do, but it will take time. Airports need to resurrect their flight schedules and, that, and bringing the aircraft back into service will also take time. It will not be an overnight event coming back uh, to normal flying. Airline and airport security must meet the new challenge of threats from biosecurity and how that blends into future airport processes um, with a suite, suite of, of, of technology and innovation to get people moving. The goal of all airlines is to process passengers quickly and efficiently from checking to the gate. Airports want passengers in there duty free and retail as soon as possible. Security must adapt to the processes, as I said, through technology. So at ICTS, we've not stood still and we, we have innovated and we continue to, to de develop new technology to help airlines and airports as we move safely and securely through the new COVID world, post-COVID world. Andy, thank you very much indeed. So three really uh, uh, interesting points. I wonder whether I could pick up on one of the issues that cropped up a few weeks ago. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, Ali, you alluded to this in your opening statements. So let me come perhaps to Jeff first uh, and then Andy to comment after that. Um, one of the issues that's emerged is this issue about the requirements of following COVID-19 restrictions, not patting down social distancing. Um, um, and the argument was on the webinar, and I think it was Ali who made a comment actually, well, the argument on the webinar was that this makes it unsafe, that, that if you can't do that, you can't be totally secure and we should be worried. So Jeff first, Annie second, more thinking more generally about the restrictions imposed by COVID-19. Um, how worried should we be, Jeff? Well, I think one of the one of the big issues that, that's been overlooked quite a lot, and it is at the core of many of the many of the problems that we've seen about how um, how the the, the, the stop-start element of the, um, of the restart has, has been happening, is that there's a there's a lack of uniformity in different parts of the in parts of the industry about how those regulations are going to be applied in many cases at the early stage i mean let's face it nobody knew what the right approach was um, and there was nobody giving guidance the early stage guidance from ikao aci and iata was pretty vague uh, but it was no more vague than any government was handing out it was all 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 very much in a, in a situation of people trying to, to second guess what was going to happen next and as a result of that, you've got various different types of um, uh, different um, types of checking at different points in every passenger's journey. And quite rightly, every passenger is asking the question, why is it that I can walk through one airport uh, with no mask on and not get checked? And then I come to another airport and I'm getting mandatory testing and I've got to wear a mask, et cetera, et cetera. Now, whichever of those particular pieces is, is beneficial to the, to the, to the re reduction in, in a transmission, it just makes it extremely difficult for any one airport in that chain to be able to apply any measures if they're not consistent with the people at the other points in the passenger journey. And I think that's one of the, one of the big issues is that was a, 
very much a lack or a slowness in, in getting to a point where we could get any consensus, even within any one particular country, in different operators and different airports in the same in the same jurisdiction, about how they were going to apply different tests. And that lack of um, that lack of lack of consistency just breeds the lack of trust in the passengers, and which gives them a perception that nobody really knows what they're doing. And that's a that's a problem. Is it's it's creating this this it's, or it's perpetuating the situation where um, nobody knows who to trust or whether people are just randomly uh, applying different measures just to uh, just just for the heck of it. And that's a situation we need to get away from. I think in future we need to come to a, a much more rapid consensus uh, and much more agreement between different uh, airports in in individual passenger journeys make sure that we're applying something that looks consistent so that we can start to generate some trust in the passengers that we all know what it is that we're trying to achieve. Yeah, it makes sense. So Andy, let me just get your thoughts on this and I'll come to, to Ali. Um, Andy? Yeah, I def definitely agree. There needs to be um, a uniformity of how procedures are, are adapted across the world. And probably the best organisation to do that would be IATA. They, obviously, they bring out um, books such as How to Handle Dangerous Goods, um, maybe now it's time that they, they need to bring out a book on how to handle uh, life in aviation uh, with you know, bio threats um, and how. So they're, they're, it's already there. We just need everybody pulling together in, in, in one, one direction. And Andy, I suppose from your point of view as a supplier, um, how much responsibility is there on you as a supplier? to uh, um, concern your, I mean, you, your staff, okay, can't pack down and they will got to wear masks or what have you. And um, I'm just wondering whether you feel that uh, is going to uh, obviously uh, inhibit the ability to do security well, or is it being compensated for by other things? Um, it, obviously, we, um, from our point of view, we, we're, we're looking for behavioral detection first. Um, and it does obviously been unable to pat down does obviously cause problems, but there are you know there are ways around that hopefully that we can move on. Um, what we do need to do is to get a uniform set of measures at the airports so that customers coming to the airports have got uh, health health passports um, that shows that they've had um, either been COVID tested, had the vaccine, and that that should then bring us all back to some sort of normality. But we need to get to that that level first. Okay, I mean, Ali, you raise this point, and uh, um, it is an interesting point. Uh, Ali, so what extent are you concerned that uh, um, there will be security lapses as a lack of, because of a failure are uh, to get a, a united approach to uh, uh, implementing security across airports. Ali. Ali, you're on mute. Okay, good. Okay, I've, I've got um, <clears throat> concerns of security and safety. My security concerns is that now people are afraid of taking the physical actions against the customer or patting down, touching, and, and um, you know, these days you can, you can have something non-metallic. So you can walk into an aircraft having something, but because you're not supposed to be touching anyone or keeping a distance, you will not be patting them down to ensure that they don't have non-metallic objects on board the aircraft. You can be also um, taking um, shortcuts by not physically um, doing the screening of luggages and um, carry-ons um, on the aircraft. Now, these are things that um, even the five levels of um, um, security that the baggage goes through might not be implemented because we're trying not to have hands on with the passengers uh, belongings. Now, the other item that I'm really afraid of also, the amount of, of, um, of um, as a safety item, the crew are not searched. I mean, the crew are not searched, not only are they not searched, the crew are not um, actually um, tested or quarantined. Oh, you can have a crew, a pilot, and maybe 13 if it's a large aircraft uh, crew, okay? And um, they never go through any testing at all. So, I mean, uh, somebody can go into the aircraft if they're a carrier or they are sick, and they can give it to the crew. We are putting everybody else on quarantine six days to 
nine days in Oman, for example, but all our crew, okay, they're not tested, they're not put in quarantine, we don't know what they carry with them, okay, what they're going to bring into the country, what they're going to come out, and the majority of our cases are from people coming from abroad here in Oman. So, I mean, this is one country, but I'm saying um, other countries, I have not heard of any crew uh, having to be going in through quarantine or going through extra um, um, you know, precautions of, of testing um, from like the other passengers. Yeah, That's okay. my two words. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, um, very interesting. I have to say, all this is quite new to me. I, I'm uh, quite intrigued by it. Um, Jeff, let's uh, get a question to you first. Then I'll come to Ali, then Andy on the same question, since he wants all of your views. Uh, Jerry Shields, uh, uh, Jeff, has says that although you describe how aviation security can take a backseat or struggle with convergence, it often leads within our profession from BDOs to scanning and thermology. OK. Uh, um, Arguably, this is partly propelled by having tighter regulation in comparison to other security disciplines. What would the panel see as the key regulatory changes from which the wider security sector could benefit generally? So um, I think the point is about looking at regulators as the response is specifically, Jeff. It's a big question, but where should the priorities be for regulators? But I'll come to you, Ali, and then you, Andy. Jeff. Well, it, it's it's really doing the same as has been has happened in some of the other industries and in getting away from a compliance based culture to more of a risk risk based culture with um, uh, design basis threats being defined within the industry for specific countries and specific uh, uh, situations and types of transportation. Um, at the moment, we still there is uh, you can see what with what the CAA have been doing in the UK around the, the around the SEMS uh, concept with building uh, security management systems that are that are much more risk led as in a similar in a similar way to what they've done with with uh, safety systems in, in with the CAA, but the but that's not universally applied, and in a lot of places we still do see uh, a compliance led culture, and that compliance led culture just means that regulations becomes very very heavy handed. And it means that many of the operators find themselves having to comply with levels of, or standards of safety and security that may be not appropriate for their own particular situation. And although that's very laudable uh, in countries and for airports that have got the revenue to be able to uh, afford all of those measures, all it does mean elsewhere is that they, they, they have only got one pot to, to pay for or everything that they have to do. And they just take things out of that pot because they've got to pay for levels of compliance that maybe they don't need, either on the safety or on the security side of things. So I think that we need to move to a, a culture within aviation that is far more risk led, uh, as opposed to being purely compliance led. Um, and I know that there's, uh, there's, there's, there are arguments on both sides of the fence, but I think that it's clear from what's happened in certain other industries that a, a more risk focused uh, um, approach uh, where we don't think of every, everything as just being entirely about safety or entirely about security, but we take more of a blended approach uh, where we create a, a culture of, of, of being uh, an outcomes-led focused, uh, risk-led uh, outcomes focused uh, system of, 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 uh, of uh, ensuring that people meet the necessary standards. Uh, that's that's the that's has been the approach that has been adopted in other industries, and it is adopted to a certain extent in aviation, but not globally. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Ali, the question from Jerry is specifically about regulation and the role that regulation can play. Uh, uh, what would you see as uh, the priorities here, if indeed you think it's important? I think, I think, um, as Jeffrey said, uh, first of all, I think we've got to um, have um, regulations that com um, we comply for the same sort of uh, rules and regulations as for the customer and uh, passengers. We cannot have certain regulation where you are, I think anybody who's traveling into the country, um, having to go through uh, quarantine, having to go through testing after a certain number of days where the crew are not. They're not protected. They can be carriers. They are not only dangerous for their families, but for the other staff and for the other passengers who are on that aircraft. And I think another thing about regulation is that um, it's very important that um, the regulations should be, should be um, um, from higher up above coming down. I've, I'll give an example, which you probably don't know that um, if you walk into Zanzibar Airport or Tanzania Airport, any airport in Tanzania, Dar es Salaam or Zanzibar or whatever, when you leave the airport, they, they force you to take off your mask. 
They have denied having COVID in the world until recently, last week. But before that, that's another example of people not taking it seriously enough. So you'd be carrying it from one country to another. And if you've got crew flying into those places, coming out, not being tested, you, you don't really have a regulatory um, compliance. Yeah, interesting point. I didn't know that either. Uh, um, okay, thank you very much indeed. I'll come back to you in a minute. Uh, uh, Andy, so um, your thoughts, I'm interested in this. Um, look at the role of regulators. Now, as a supplier, what do you see as the uh, uh, key requirement? What would you like a regulator to do for you? Well, I, I think we still need to keep the standards and security as they are pre-COVID, as, uh, as they were. Um, what we need to do as an industry is to uh, find a way to get that terminal COVID-free or virus-free. And that includes the crews as well. And uh, the industry is very adaptable when it comes to uh, issues and problems in the past. Uh, there's no reason why technology can't, can't be found. And I know that we're not far off on a number of those um, to make those terminals virus free. And then you'll regulate your, your, reg, your um, security regulations are maintained. Your, your security standards are maintained uh, from conventional terrorism. Um, but we need to get those terminals um, virus-free. And there's ways to do that. There has to be ways. But, but Andy, how confident are you that <laughs> you will be able to get up, um, speed up? Because one of the things that Ali mentioned in his opening statements was some of the real-life difficulties in getting back to, to where we were. So you set that as a, we must do that. But I mean, um, I mean, the examples given earlier, and I think we discussed this, there have been staff losses in airports. So it's a matter of either recruiting more staff or training up more people. There's issues about getting them to take issues seriously, like questioning people and questioning doctors when they haven't been doing it in any sort of determined way for a long time. That strikes me as a human, a huge human logistical challenge. Is it? It probably is, but I think it's doable, uh, and it has to be doable to, to maintain security standards, um, as we know it. Um, you know, for uh, Ali mentioned the crew. I think the crews need to be tested when they get to the airport. Are they a security weakness? Um, I think everybody that works at an airport could be a security weakness. Uh, the inside of the, the inside of the threat doesn't doesn't go away. Um, but um, I think I think they do need to be tested, as as do the staff. And the, the sooner that we get uh, a sure um, testing mechanism um, on the ground, uh, and there's some coming, there's some out there that are cheap and effective. I think it's a real possibility. Okay, okay, thank you very much, Jeff. Let me come back to you. Um, Camilla Chu uh, put a question up. I just want to make sure we 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 do it justice. Where she asked specifically, Jeff about whether um, wearing masks was an impediment to facial recognition. Um, Jeff, I wonder whether you could address that specific question, but I, I would like to expand this a bit. We had a question in advance um, asking about, uh, you, you just mentioned it in passing, Andy, about the potential of technologies to make a difference. Um, now, uh, um, perhaps, Jeff, I could I'll come to you specifically on, is is uh, facial recognition being undermined by wearing masks, number one? And two, about comment more generally on the potential of technology to help us out of the uh, overall problem. Jeff first. Um, well, I'm going to answer those in reverse order because the, the one really, really important thing is that no camera ever caught a terrorist. Uh, people do that. Um, all systems and solutions that go into any environment uh, are a combination of properly trained and equipped pe uh, people following sensibly put together processes and using to technology and appropriate range of technology as the tools that they require to help them do that. And that's pretty much always going to be the case. Um, we can, there are technologies obviously that we can use that are going to support us in doing what we need to do. But at the end of the day, it's a, we are talking about people moving in an environment and, and we need to use people to do that. And I think people are always going to want to see people. It, it, they, even, even though they might not want to catch anything from them, they're going to want to see people and people are a great deterrent. The, uh, the, the question about facial recognition is a, is a little bit more interesting. Um, uh, for a start, um, Lots of poorly calibrated facial recognition systems are really good at detecting people who are not, not wearing masks, because anybody that isn't wearing a mask is immediately detected as a face that it can't recognize. So um, a lot of the technologies that have been are out there at the moment for face mask detection um, are actually just slightly tweaked facial recognition te uh, technologies. But 
Uh, yes, obviously. The, 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 the thing with facial recognition is that all of the systems out there only give you a level of confidence that they are, they are identifying a specific individual. Um, and all of the parameters around the recognition can be wound back as far as you want so that they use fewer and fewer characteristics to identify a particular face. And so if you want to have a poor level of confidence, you can still use a, a lot of the of, of fairly, um, fairly um, normal facial recognition technologies to do that. But the less of the face that you've got to work with, the fewer the characteristics that you've got in the first place within, within your template. And so you're going to get a poorer and poorer potential match. Uh, so it depends on what you want to use facial recognition for. If you want to use it for a, a relatively low level of of of, uh, of, of uh, level of confidence match with a with a face that you've already seen perhaps minutes before to check whether the same face that you saw at the check-in desk is the same face that you're seeing at the immigration counter, then a low level of confidence is probably okay because you've got supporting documentation that you're going to use along with that to give you effectively a multi-factor identification solution. But if you're looking for something to positively identify somebody to, to, to decide whether or not they should be allowed on board an aircraft with no other supporting information, then you, you need a very high level of confidence with that. And the only way you can get high levels of confidence is with lots of points of recognition. And that means prob probably removing face, re removing face masks. Yeah, and you see, but it's an interesting point, isn't it? Because we've been hearing uh, with great, uh, for most of us, great reassurance over pre-COVID that airports were now to behavioural analysis and to gait analysis and to, uh, facial recognition. It all builds up a sort of certain confidence that, um, 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 and yet really you begin to understand that one element of that is being undermined by this initiative. And just as an aside here, we had a, uh, quite a few months back, we had a, two ex-offenders on here talking on uh, this panel. And they were talking about, this is a good time to go shoplifting because you've now got a a good excuse to wear a mask all their life they wanted to remain disguised in store and now they've got the perfect way of doing it uh, um just very quickly jeff because i want to get on to ali and, and andy uh, um it does seem a, a, a major opportunity lost uh, um for identifying offenders uh, well, well what it is and, and, and absolutely there's a lot of wonderful technology out there for things like gate analysis and other forms of behavioral analysis but as we've already said Every airport is under massive financial pressure right now, and they would much. Uh, the, the the point about um, uh, aviation revenue is, uh, you know, even very recently, airports make roughly a third out of aviation, a third out of parking, and a third out of duty free. Duty free is shrinking because people aren't park, aren't shopping at the airports anymore. Uh, parking is shrinking because people are using other modes of transport. Aviation revenue is shrinking because the low the budget airlines are putting uh, uh, airports under more pressure to reduce landing costs. So they've got to find the money from somewhere and they're not going to go spending on esoteric technologies like gate analysis. No. OK, uh, Ali, so interested to get your thoughts. Uh, so the last question was more about will regulation be a response? And I suppose this is more generally, is technology a good way of getting out of this problem? Ali. Yes. Um, what one of the things that, uh, for example, we've uh, done, we've got a five uh, story building. And each um, level, there is a uh, facial recognition, and you have to lower your mask to look into the cameras. So we don't have to hold a card. We don't have to touch anything. Even the elevators, we don't have to touch them physically. It's a proximity elevator. So technology has made wonders. Um, in airports, um, during the pandemic, I've had to travel, and many airports as well. They've got um, um, a facial recognition where you stand at least a few meters from the person, but you still have to take off your mask and you've got to see physically the person and they will look at your passport without even touching your passport or scan your passport okay and they will ask you to scan it but i mean technology has got a very very big um, work on this and i think um many companies have brought up many solutions and and um this is something that um, we've never seen in our you know um, um lifetime before where companies have, have um, gone so far on and they've tried their best to to you know leap in and bring in technology to reduce contact, to reduce, you know, by distance um, leveraging why you can, you, can, you, can, you can ensure that that person is the correct person. But the basic of human, human element is still very important. So it will, technology will never replace um, human um, 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 efforts on, on identifying people, but it will be something that will be um, used as a add-ons uh, to, to reduce 
the amount of of um, of, of um, you know in, in interconnecting uh, people together, but to be able to secure ourselves from distances. Do you know one of the? It's interesting you should say this, Ali, and 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 uh, you, Jeff, because one of the interesting things about the previous ninety-two webinars, uh, and maybe I'll get you to comment on this, Andy, that's come through to me as a as a listener of all ninety-two, is that um, uh, this point about technology. Nearly all of you panelists say, "Yeah, it's great, but we're dependent on humans. The role of humans is crucial." It's quite reassuring, I have to say, I, to tell you the truth. Uh, from where I sit in the world. Um, um, Andy, your point, I mean, the question is about the extent to which technology offers a uh, solution, and you mentioned this in your last answer. Uh, um, and I just wonder the extent to which uh, you as a supplier feel this could help you. Um, we've been hearing about how it can detect temperatures, we've been hearing about how it can um, manage queues, we've been hearing about the various ways in which uh, officers with uh, their body-worn cameras can uh, uh, induce uh, a response from people by making it clear they're being watched. I mean, okay, those are well rehearsed. Going forward, Andy, where do you see technology helping you as a supplier? Oh, hugely. We, we've been um, developing over the last year when this virus, um, you know, arrived, we developed a back in the air initiative. We want the aircraft to be in the air. Make, make, you know, we want the aircraft shouldn't be on the ground. They should be up flying. And so we've got a back in the air initiative. Um, we're soon to, to partner with three airports in the UK, COVID test centers in conjunction with a health company. So that'll be coming out soon. We're working closely with Imperial College London. We're working with a company that's called Virusite, which has a new system for detecting COVID. And it's cheap. It, uh, we think it'll be around about the 10 pound per test uh, and, and gives you a test in 20 seconds. Um, and what's good about this technology is that if there's COVID-22, God forbid, or COVID-24, you take the chip out of the machine, you, you put an, uh, the new chip in that detects the new virus, whether it's um, Ebola or anything else. So we can do that overnight and we're ready to go again next morning. Um, we've got a standalone um, uh, mobile device on an app that's, that's called CertiFly. Um, so that is um, a... a um, that takes pictures of the COVID documentation and is loaded into the passengers PNR. We've already got that. Uh, we've got. Uh, we've been working with Delta in Rome um, on a, on COVID free flights. We've got touchless smart apps. We've developed touchless smart apps, and we're at four kiosks, uh, four airports in Nigeria where the kiosks allow passengers to safely and easily check in using their smartphones if they've got smartphones. Um, We've been working with Lufthansa in Munich. We've got the Sentinel kiosk, which we've developed, which checks your temperature as you get, get your boarding pass and as you board the flight. Um, so you've got it at, at check-in as you get your boarding pass. You've got it at the boarding gate as well. Um, and we're working with Bangalore Airport, which is the first um, airport to have end-to-end -end biometric boarding programs via our smart app kiosk. So we're moving along as quick as we can and, and, and coming up with some um, you know, new ideas to get get passengers moving and get them safe and secure. Yeah, I mean that's uh, that's uh, that, that seems quite a lot. There's quite a lot of uh, possibilities here. There's, yeah. there's a huge amount of work. We've been doing a huge amount of work um, in the background. Okay, Jeff. Question um, uh, um, uh, sent in advance uh, uh, was: uh, To what extent will we as passengers uh, um, be hindered or helped? as users of airports and airlines in the new normal and he's got the new normal in inverted commas uh, um jeff are we going to see a drastically different experience at airports as we begin to move back to using airlines again you're on mute jeff yeah sorry about that yeah i, I think i think that we will um and and part of that is simply because we we've dismantled so much of the infrastructure that was there prior to covid and it's that's going to take some time to put back in place again um and there there are economies of scale on this it's it's uh, it's relatively easy to do things when you've got a pile of people in the airport because they're handling lots and lots of flights but if there, if there's no flights and no passengers then you won't have the people there to do it um, and I think that, that we need to be really wary about the um, the way in which um, the, the 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 new norm in, in aviation, whatever that's going to look like, we're going to be very careful about how that that comes about because we are, you know, there's a lot of talk about things like health passports, 
Now, how, how are health passports actually going to work? Because that's actually quite a difficult thing to make happen uh, in a way that just doesn't either massively discriminate against an enormous portion of the world's population because they, they come from poor countries where it's difficult to make that happen. Or they, in, they, they provide a, a huge opportunity for uh, criminals to, do, um, to, to produce fraudulent health passports, to, to, to forge documents and to make things work in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that we don't want it to work. I have, a, I have a yellow fever card. It's a piece of paper that's got somebody's signature on it. That's not very good as a credential to use in, in a situation where we've got a, a deadly disease that's being transmitted around the world very, very rapidly. And we all have to put our hands up and say, to be honest, it was the aviation industry that facilitated that. So we need systems that are going to be secure and safe and that are going to uh, not just introduce more opportunities for, for, for risk, but are going to actually uh, work in a way, in a connected way, that enables uh, flights, uh, uh, aviation industry to come back in, in operation normally. And that's inevitably going to look different. And as we saw in post 9-11 days, we saw it, it took quite a long time to introduce anything, but we, you saw this enormous step change in levels of, of screening at, at airports, which just made everything, everybody's perception was that airports just got worse mm -hmm. because you had to do more. But it was a necessary evil. And after each one of the different instances, the, the liquid removal, the shoe bomber, the underpants bomber, each one of these incidents has resulted in more security and a, a worse and worse experience for passengers. And this, because this is a situation where we're not just trying to pick out one person in a crowd who we can probably find because if we use enough screening technology, we'll be able to find out that they carry, a, they carry a, a, an explosive or a weapon. This is something that might be very, very hidden uh, in some countries that have less sophisticated screening uh, of passengers as they get on board, uh, it, it's far more likely that, that, that the virus is going to slip, slip through the, either this virus or one in the future. And then we need to be able to stop that, stop that at the other end. Inevitably, this is going to be more screening, more checks, more different technologies, and eventually that's going to filter down into a poorer passenger experience. It, I can't really see any other way that that can happen. We can mitigate that a little bit by planning ahead and start to looking at how we design our airports and how we change the designs of our airports to be more secure against things like airborne viruses. We can take, we can uh, adopt a lot of touchless technologies. But we also need to look at how we space gates, how we do, how we do boarding, how we how we arrange queues, what we do with people's baggage. All of these things need to be thought about in, within the whole airport context if we're going to make these places secure. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to ask for a very quick comment from Ali and Andy on the same on the same point, and we'll finish on that. Ali, just very very quickly, with my 30 seconds, your thoughts on the new normal and the passenger experience. Jeff feels it's going to be a bit worse to you. Ali, you're, you're, you're on mute, Ali. Sorry. Um, I think it's going to get worse before it gets any better because um, until we can have a uniformity of rules and regulations and we can have uniformity of passenger and crew okay, being uh, treated as, as um, possible carriers of this uh, pandemic, um, we will go to us, to us. I mean, um, for example, you can just imagine the crew have got to search every pocket in every seat after the, the passengers leave the aircraft. Once they do the cleaning, they've got to go and do again a hand search, okay? So they will be touching everything that's in the aircraft and then coming out of that. So we need uh, to have better regulations and I think uniformity in how serious we, we want to take this, uh, these measures. And I think um, the industry is already suffering, but we need we need to have more regulations into that. Thank you very much indeed. Andy, I'm gonna to come to you just for the final question. It's just come in, but I wanna do justice about 30 seconds, Andy, which is not fair a time to answer the question. Jan um, Delheimer says, when will flights go back to some kind of normality, given the frequent cancellations of flights and uncertainty around the world, any rough estimation, Andy? Can we get back to normal from a security point of view, can we? Quickly. I think I personally think we'll start to see a kick start um, this summer, but it won't be it won't be at um, pre COVID levels. It takes time to get uh, aviation fired up again. Um, so I'm, I'm probably not thinking till 2022 that we'll be back to pre COVID levels, but there will be some flying this summer for sure. 
Panel, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your contribution. That was absolutely outstanding. I mean, I have to say, a lot of that I didn't know myself. I was um, sometimes I am on panel I know quite a bit beforehand. This one I didn't. So much is happening, and of course we go into this new normal, and there are a number of challenges. Good to see though that there are the thinking is going on and the issues are are being uh, tackled. Let's just very quickly make a few concluding points. Just to say to you. The OSPAs uh, around the world, entries are still open in South Africa, Kenya and Romania, and others will open very soon. So keep your eyes peeled for the Outstanding Security Performance Awards around the world. Uh, um, and just to say to you, we go through it all again next Tuesday. Oh, tomorrow, tomorrow, I have to say, we go through it again tomorrow. The status of corporate security directors. Has the pandemic changed perceptions of the leaders of security? Have the leaders been letting us down or are they example setting? We'll be critiquing that tomorrow, 3.30, same time. Uh, once again, thank you very much indeed to my panel. Thank you very much indeed to you, the audience, for joining us. Thank you very much indeed to Hannah Miller and Christine Brooks in the background. Uh, I hope to see you tomorrow, uh, but wherever you are in the world, until we see you again, stay safe.